Let's turn our Bibles together to Acts chapter 3. If you have looked in your bulletin or saw in the updates on Wednesday, I have set a pretty ambitious pace for today. So we shall get started. I will read verses 1 through 12 of chapter 3, and then I will pray and we will get started with our look at the Word of God. I remind you as I read, these are not my words. These are the words inspired by the Spirit of the living God. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to sit down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us? As if by our own power or piety, we had made him walk. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our King, we have sung our allegiance to your majesty and your holiness. And now we submit ourselves to your word and your spirit. And we ask that they would combine to amaze us. Not ultimately that the lame walk, but that sinners can be forgiven and have eternal life rather than eternal death. We pray this for the sake and the glory of our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Earlier this year, in March to be precise, I turned a corner in my life. Starting March 20th, whenever I write my age, I don't begin with a 1 or a 2 or a 3, but now I begin with a 4. I've transitioned into the decade of the 40s. That seems like a long time. It's hard to believe sometimes that I've been alive for 40 years. And as I look back over four decades of life, my life has been filled with a lot of activity. As a kid, I was very rambunctious and energetic, always on the move. I'm sure my progeny betrays that in my family. I played a lot of sports when I was a kid. I've, I love to hike. I love to ride bicycles. I love to be active and do things. And it's hard to imagine arriving at 40 years of age without ever one time walking along a gentle brook, walking along a, a lakeside, 
It's hard to believe that I could have possibly lived this long and never climbed a hill or climbed a tree or ridden my bike. The man who is healed in this narrative I just read was 40-something, and his lameness began when he was born. Never having the opportunity to ride a bike or climb a tree. And this, of course, predates all of the technology which exists now, where people can get around pretty amazingly, even if they can't walk. They can buy vans which contain wheelchairs that are motorized, where they can basically by themselves drive here and there and get in another motorized vehicle and go through the mall and such. I remember earlier this summer as we were in St. Louis and we were preparing to go on a bike ride with my brother and his family, and one of the most astonishing things I think I've ever seen was this van where a, a contraption on the top, it looked like a, a storage unit, opened up and a bike descended and a woman got out clearly unable to use her legs and she got out and put herself in this bike and then wheeled herself back to the, to the rear of the van and another riding bike came out and she replaced herself into that one and put it all back with her arms and with the machine and she went on a bike ride not too far ahead of us. Amazing, this woman drove this van and got on these bikes without the assistance of her legs or any other human being. But 2,000 years ago when this took place, of course, none of that technology existed. This man had never been from here to there without somebody picking him up and carrying him. And he was now utterly and totally dependent upon these people who would carry him. And they would take him every day to the temple where he would be utterly dependent upon the gifts and the mercy of people walking by into the temple. Can you imagine such an existence, such a life? How did he get through the normal functions of day in and day out living? And he's lying there, and Peter and John walk by, and he cries out, will you please help me, have mercy on me, something like that. And Peter looks at him and says, I don't have any money with me, but I'm going to give you something beyond your wildest dreams. I'm going to give you something money can't buy. Even 2,000 years from now, money will not be able to buy this. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he held out his hand, and the man got up and didn't just walk. He leaped, he danced, he rejoiced and was singing praises to God for this miraculous healing. Now you know this story. This is not new to you. But I want to draw your attention to something maybe you haven't thought of before. Why did Peter do this? Why this man on this occasion? Was it just the providence of God that Peter was brought to the path of, of this man who was lame and the Spirit of God came upon Peter and he just decided to heal this man? Maybe, probably. But I want to suggest there's something else going on here. Do you remember what we've seen every step of the way thus far in Acts? Peter has become a Christian student of the Bible. He is now reading the Old Testament as a Christian, not as a Jew. And he's scouring the Old Testament, looking for how this passage and that one and that one point us to Jesus Christ. How do they prepare for and anticipate and typify the coming of Messiah? And I'm convinced, beloved, that Peter has been immersing himself lately in the book of Isaiah. Will you give me a moment and let me just read to you Isaiah 35? Don't go there, just listen. Hear the promises of God of someday his restoration, his, his refreshment that would come to his people. Here's what he said. The wilderness and the desert will be glad, and the desert will rejoice and blossom like the crocus It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. 
Encourage the exhausted and strengthen the feeble. Say to those with anxious hearts, take courage, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like deer. And the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The scorched land will become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, its resting place, grass becomes reeds and rushes. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way, and fools will not wander on it. No lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, with everlasting joy upon their heads. They will find gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. See, I'm I'm persuaded that Peter has been pondering Isaiah. And he's reading it as a Christian. And he's saying, how does this point to Christ? Messiah has come. How does this tell me about what's going to take place in Christ, in the new age, in the kingdom of God that has been inaugurated? And he's thinking and pondering of the fact that someday those who can't speak will start shouting with joy. Those who can't hear will suddenly be able to hear the glory of God. And those who have been blind will suddenly see, and it is time for lame men to start leaping. And these things are rolling around in his head as he's walking to the temple, and there right before him is a man who says, have mercy on me, I am just a beggar who can't walk. And Peter believed the word of God. And he said, okay, It's time to show you what is now true. The Messiah has come. Get up and walk. And Luke doesn't want us to miss it because repeatedly he says, he walked, he leapt, he walked, he leapt, he leapt. Isaiah's prophecy is being fulfilled in their own eyes. This explains Peter's questions to the people. The crowds come rushing forward as as the word starts spreading. They all know this guy. They've passed him every day as they went to the temple for 40 years. They know he can't walk, and here he is leaping and singing. And Peter asked the question. Did you catch that? Verse 12, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Are you kidding me? Why are we amazed at this? This guy doesn't walk. He can't walk. His feet don't work. Are you serious, Peter, in this question? And then he says, why are you looking at us as though we made him walk? Well, let's see. He's clutching you, hanging on to you, praising God for you, and he's been lame for 40 years, now he's walking. Is it take a rocket scientist to determine that A plus P equals C? Look, You made him walk. It's obvious. And this is astonishing. So why does Peter say, don't be amazed? It's kind of like what I experience every week. See, it is my privilege and my pleasure to pour over the Word of God for weeks, sometimes months in advance of ever getting to a particular text to preach in. And I have all of this stuff that I've been studying, and the Lord brings insights and 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 opens up the scripture, and I'm just blown away sometimes, just, just sort, of, sort of thrust into worship as I study. And I come to every Saturday night, every single one, 
with about three weeks worth of sermons that I think, okay, Lord, I've got 45 minutes tomorrow. What do I say? And how do I get those people to capture the same excitement and wonder as you have shown me? See, you all haven't had the benefit of spending that kind of time in these texts. And it's easy for me to make assumptions, to, to think, these people should be leaping out of their chairs in praise to God. Why aren't they doing that? And, and sometimes it's just because I've been immer immersed in this for, for weeks, and, and you've been immersed in it for 20 minutes. And really not even immersed, you just sort of get a little dip into the pool. See, Peter has been reflecting on this and, and pondering this and meditating on it, and it's so obvious to him what's going on. Of course the lame man is going to get up. It's what God said would happen. And it just comes out, why are you astonished? You shouldn't be surprised at this. Don't you know the word of God? Isaiah said it would happen. Do you think we did this? Come on, don't be so naive. We didn't do this. You know the word of God. God did this. That's exactly what he tells them. Verse 13, he says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. The one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. Did you notice the Old Testament phrases used for Jesus here by Peter? Do you see he's got Isaiah on the brain? He calls him, he calls Jesus, not the Son of God, but the Servant of God. He's going to close this loop in verse 26 with the same thing. But for you first, God raised up his servant. Why would he do that? Because if you're familiar with the book of Isaiah, you know there are several servant songs where Isaiah predicts the coming of the servant of the Lord. In Isaiah 52 and into 53, it is the, what we call the suffering servant who would give his life as an atoning sacrifice for his people. Peter has, has Isaiah on the brain, and he says, God raised up his servant. He glorified his servant, who is also, by the way, the Holy One, the Holy One of Israel. And he's the Righteous One, and he's the Author of Life. Some of your translations, including mine, says the Prince of Life, but I think it's better the Author of Life. That's who Jesus is. That's what the Old Testament described him as. Even the demons get this. Remember the demons showed up and said, are you, O Holy One of Israel, going to cast us out before the time? And Jesus said, be quiet. Don't tell them all who I am yet. Now, Peter has, has obviously never read How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because you notice how he goes right at them. He says, you, by the way, this, this holy one, this righteous one, this author of life, these servants of God, you disowned him. And not only did you, did you disown him, but you are the ones who delivered him over to Pilate. And, and just to make sure you understand, Pilate had resolved himself to letting Jesus go. That was his decision. That was his rendering. This man is innocent. There's no crime here. I'm going to let him go. And you protested, you men. And in spite of his decision to let him go, you clamored for his crucifixion and overturned Pilate's decision. That's what you did. You disowned him and you put him to death. You did that, Jews. You did that, men of Israel. But God raised him. And we're witnesses of that. We saw him alive. And on the basis of faith in his name, the name of Jesus, this man is now healthy. 
And then he goes on to call them to repentance. And I want you to notice three things as we read the rest of this chapter. Peter is consistently drawing from the Old Testament prophets. He is speaking of the coming restoration when Jesus returns and the judgment that will attend that restoration. Look with me starting at verse 17. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. So Peter says, look, I know you were ignorant and so were your rulers. Notice he says your rulers, not our rulers. Now, is Peter letting them off the hook here? Is Peter now open the door for agnostics everywhere? So that Men are not held accountable for what they don't know? Is that what he's doing? Saying, look, up till now, you didn't know what you're doing, and so you were were safe, but I'm going to ruin it for you because I'm going to enlighten you, and so now you're not ignorant anymore, and now you're going to be judged. Agnostics throughout the world, throughout the generations, camp on the fact that they believe if there is a God and I stand before him at judgment, I can say, look, You just didn't give me enough information. You just didn't convince me. It's your fault, ultimately, God. If you had been more clear and made it very obvious to me, then I would have, of course, worshipped you. But but I just couldn't discern from, from the information at my disposal whether or not you existed. See, Peter even said these these men acted out of ignorance. Must be must mean they're off the hook, right? No, that's not what he's talking about. He's not saying they're innocent. He just charged them with guilt. If nothing else, they disown Jesus for a murderer. A known murderer. So they had handed over an innocent man and asked for this man who had clearly been a lawbreaker to be released. They're guilty of significant sin. What he's saying is, you were ignorant of what the scriptures meant. See, Peter could identify, right? For most of his life, only a few weeks ago did Peter get it. He had been the typical Jew all this time reading the Old Testament as a Jew, thinking that God was going to restore national Israel. The Messiah was going to come and lead the Jews out from their control by the Romans and bring worldwide Jewish domination. And that's how Peter read the Old Testament. And he says, I understand you don't understand to this point what the scriptures really meant. But now I get it, and I want you to get it. So he says, men, you were ignorant, your rulers were ignorant, but the things which God announced beforehand by the prophets, that Christ would suffer, God did it. Christ died. Yes, you're the one that put him on the cross, but this was God's plan from the very beginning. He died. He suffered the atoning sacrifice, but he's alive. We've seen him. And now, I urge you, men of Israel, repent. Change your thinking about Messiah. Change your perspective on what God is doing in the world and in his promises in the Old Testament. Turn from those things and come back to God in light of the truth of the Messiah. And if you do, three things will happen. Number one, your sins will be wiped away. 
Even your sins of rejecting Christ. Even your sins of putting Jesus on the cross. Even your sins of unbelief will be forgiven and wiped away, blotted out. Second, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The third, that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you. I don't think Peter is here talking about the future. I don't think he's talking about the return of Christ here. I think he is talking about the return of Christ in verse 21, but not in verse 20. I think he's talking about Isaiah 35. If you will accept Messiah, if you will accept what is true about Jesus, if you will repent, God will bring to you this refreshing, restorative joy in Isaiah 35. You will leap like this man who's been healed. You will find your soul crying out in praise and joy and gladness because you'll understand God's purpose for the entire world and for the Jewish people, and your sins will be forgiven. In fact, you will leap with a greater joy than the lame man. Because the lame man, though he can walk and jump and leap now, he's going to die. As are you. And after death comes judgment. But you can know right now that when you stand before the judge, he will declare you righteous. Even if you were the one who put Jesus on the cross. And your soul can be restored and renewed and you can have an exulting, exuberant, joyous life praising your God in a way that you've never known before. When he says that he, the Lord may send Christ to you, the one appointed for you from his presence, I believe he means he will send Christ to you now. He was originally given to the Jews. That's what he goes on to say. In verse 25, it is you who are the sons of the prophets. And of the covenant with God made with your fathers when he said to Abraham, and in your seed and all the, uh, all the families of the earth will be blessed. For you first, Jews, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you. And here's the blessing. See, they were convinced the blessing of Abraham was going to be world domination, world kingdom. Peter says, no, that's not the blessing. The blessing is forgiveness of sin, turning you from your wicked ways. And you can receive this. Christ will be given to you, given back to you. You've rejected him once, but you can accept him now. Do it. In verse 21, he speaks of the final restoration. He says, Jesus must stay in heaven, or heaven must receive him until the period of restoration of all things. When Jesus returns. And the final form of this blessing of Isaiah 35 and the rest the fullness of all of the glory that is awaiting will come about when Jesus returns. See, we're, we're in that interim period, the now, not yet. We are in the kingdom, we're in the new age, but we're not quite yet in its fulfillment. The consummation awaits. That will come when Jesus returns. And then Peter says, the prophets all spoke of these things. Moses said, the Lord will raise up a prophet like me, you shall listen to him, and then the warning, verse 23, and it shall be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Here Peter is getting at a very important point. He's saying you Jews think you're special to God because you're Jewish. But if you reject Messiah, you're cut off. You don't get any special privilege simply by being the biological descendant of Abraham. You must accept the seed. Otherwise, you'll be cut off and destroyed. Remember in Isaiah 35 I read to you? He said the days of refreshing, the days of, of leaping and joy. God says, I will save you. But what's he saving them from? his recompense that is coming, his judgment that is coming with certainty. And Peter's saying, if you do not accept Christ, you will be subject to his judgment. Samuel, all the other prophets, all proclaim these days of Christ, the coming of the Son and the servant of God. So what's the response? How do the people react to this message. We pick it up in chapter 4. 
As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So the word gets out quickly throughout the temple area, and the leaders of the Jews hear this, the, the priests and the temple guard, the Sadducees, everybody comes rushing out there to see what these guys are doing, and they're disturbed by two things. One, that these guys would have the audacity to, to teach the people. These were not schooled men. They were not rabbinically trained. These were not scholars. They had no business teaching. That was the way the, the rulers thought. And secondly, they were very upset that they were teaching the resurrection. Because as mentioned here, the Sadducees were one of the large groups here. They were influential in the priesthood. And the Sadducees denied the future resurrection of anybody. So they didn't like this at all. So they threw him in jail. But Luke tells us, 2,000 men that day, at that sermon, believed the gospel. Now, it's interesting that, that Luke says that's the number of men. He may be implying that this is just the males and it doesn't include the women and children. It's possible that instead of the church now growing to about 5,000, that it grew to something like 15,000 just on this day. We don't know. But either way, even though these men were thrown in jail, the gospel bore fruit in the lives of thousands. And they came to belief in the Messiah. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, are you getting a serious sense of deja vu here? Just a few weeks ago, Jesus himself sat in this room before these men in the same semicircle, and they questioned him. And he said, who do you think you are? By whose power are you doing these things? Are you the Christ? Tell us. Jesus had a different mission. Jesus had a mission to go to the cross. So he kept his mouth shut. He didn't defend himself. He didn't explain himself. He didn't go performing miracles right there in their presence to prove that he was from God. He just sat there quietly, let them cast their false accusations let them insult him and slap him and, and ridicule him because his destiny was the cross. What's going to happen now? What's going to happen to Peter and John as they stand where Jesus stood? Are they going to sit quietly? No, because they have a different mission. Now, Jesus told them beforehand this would happen, remember? He said, they're going to hate you. You're going to be hated by all kinds of people. You're going to be hated by kings and governors and rulers of the people. And they're going to persecute you and they're going to throw you in jail. But don't prepare beforehand what you're going to say. Don't have your defense ready. Don't think through it all. Don't start arguing this premise and then this premise and then this premise and this conclusion. Don't have a well choreographed speech. Because the Spirit of God will give you words of wisdom in the time of need. And what do we see in verse, verse 8? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for, get this, for a benefit done to a sick man, if, if we're being tried today because a guy who couldn't walk can now walk, I think he interjected right there something like, really? <laughs> As to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene whom you crucified, 
whom God raised from the dead. By this name this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. This is a changed man, beloved. Just a few weeks ago when Jesus was sitting there in his trial, where was Peter? He had turned tail and run. I don't know the man. Do not associate me with that Jesus guy. I've never seen him before. I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Three times he said, I don't know that man. And here Peter is on trial for his life, possibly, where the same men who condemned Jesus to death may condemn Peter to death. He's a transformed individual. Seeing the risen Christ, being filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter says, you want to know why I'm here? You want to know the name which I proclaim in the healing of this man? I will tell you. I will tell you with confidence. I will tell you with boldness. Kill me. I don't care. This man walks because of Jesus of Nazareth. And you guys, by the way, killed him. You are the one the scripture prophesied about that would reject him. Peter again has the Old Testament coursing through his veins. He is quoting now and preaching from Psalm 118. This should be a familiar psalm to you. Let me read the first couple verses of Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Oh, let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let all who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. That's familiar to you. We say it every Sunday morning. We've Christianized it. But we're taking our our call to worship right out of Psalm 118. Well, here's what the psalmist goes on to say. This psalm is a cry for God's deliverance, for his salvation. He says, open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you for you have answered me and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh Lord, do save, we beseech you. Lord, we beseech you, send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And Peter here says to these men, you are the ones the psalmist was talking about. You rejected the chief stone. You are the master builders who are examining each rock to see if it would fit well in the new structure you're making. And you took this one and said, It doesn't fit, and you threw it out. And God has taken that stone that you threw out and has placed it as the first stone, the cornerstone, which in ancient architecture was the most significant and important stone. It set the parameters for everything else. It is that rock upon which the entire edifice is built. You are the ones, men of Israel, who have rejected that stone. You crucified the Messiah. And then, when he says there's no salvation in anyone else and there's no other name given under heaven, Peter's not simply launching into new material here. He's reciting right out of Psalm 118. When the psalmist cries out for salvation, the response is, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There is salvation only in the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And Peter says, I'm going to tell you again who it is who comes in the name of the Lord. It is Jesus. Your only hope of salvation is in Jesus. Because he's the one who's coming in the name of the Lord. It's his name you must call upon. Whoever, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Jesus also quoted from Psalm 118. He stood over Jerusalem weeping because they had rejected him. And he said, Behold, 
your house, your temple, is left to you desolate. It's going to be demolished. Your mighty structure that you take such pride in, not one stone will be left on top of another, predicting the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And he said to these Jewish people, you will never see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He said to them the same thing Peter's saying. Peter's just quoting his, his Lord. The only way for these Jewish men to be saved from the wrath of God is to believe and accept and acknowledge that Jesus is Messiah because there's only salvation in his name. There is no other name. Now these leaders, verse 13, they observed the boldness or the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. These leaders of the Jewish people are looking at Peter and John and saying, where did they get such confidence to interpret the scriptures like this? They haven't been to the, to the rabbi schools. They haven't been formally trained. Why are they sitting here preaching to us this interpretation of the scripture? And then it clicked. Of course. These are disciples of that Jesus guy. This is how Jesus interpreted the Old Testament. And they wanted to shut him up. They wanted to go outside and proclaim the blasphemy and false teaching of these two. But they had one problem. A man who had been lame for 40 years is now walking around. What do they do with that? They could go out and say, these guys are liars. However, how are they going to explain the lame man leaping? They're stuck. So they sent him outside for a minute. Verse 15, when they ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, though we sure would like to. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. All right, so we're sitting here, we're sitting here in court you're the court. You call yourselves the court and the rulers of God. Here's our question. O oh, men of God, do we obey you or do we obey God? He says, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them. On account of the people, because they were glorifying God for what had happened, for the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. When they had re been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Oh, there's so many things here. I'll just draw our attention back to the most significant for us. Number one. You probably know what my application point number one is going to be for the rest of the series of Acts. We have to read the Bible like Christians, not as Jews. Christianity is not a new religion. It didn't start 2,000 years ago. This was not plan B. God didn't have a plan going for Israel and then suddenly switch gears because Israel rejected Messiah. This has been God's plan from before the foundation of the world. Revelation says he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It's not that God has replaced Israel with the church. God has fulfilled his plan from the beginning of time in the church, in us. All the scriptures point to this. It's all about Christ. It consummates in Christ. 
And now it doesn't matter Jew or Gentile, it matters in Christ or out of Christ. We are those who also are the recipients of the blessing that in Abraham's seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's good news for us. We're not second class citizens, we're not afterthoughts, we're not stepchildren. We are the primary fulfillment of God's promises. Now, in terms of chronology, it started with the Jews. In terms of God's ultimate plan, it was always going to be about those who are in Christ. Secondly, this promise that if you repent and turn to Christ, your sins will be wiped away, it doesn't get any better than that. The imagery is that on ancient papyrus, the ink didn't have acid in it, so it wouldn't settle into the material. And it would be possible to take a wet sponge and wipe off the lettering. That's the imagery Peter is using here to say, all who repent of their sins, all who put their faith in Jesus Christ, have a list, some of our lists are miles and miles long, right, of sins written in very, very tiny font with some big, bold ap, uh, exclamation points. And the moment we turn to Christ, God takes that sponge and wipes it clean. If you are a believer today, if you have received Jesus Christ, then no matter what is on that list, even rejecting him out of hand for years, even if you had been there and said crucify him, no matter what is on that list, and no matter how long that list is, Jesus himself has taken the sponge and wiped it clean. That ought to make somebody leap for joy. That's good news. That's good news. The last thing is, we are, by definition as Christians, exclusivists. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean that if we are genuine believers, then we, by default, ascribe to the position that you can only be forgiven in Jesus Christ. You've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. There's a view out there that all roads lead to God, and that is true. Every road, every single road someone goes down gets you to God. But only one prepares you for that meeting. Only in and by the name of Jesus Christ will you stand before God and be proclaimed righteous. Through every other means, you will be condemned. We must not apologize for being exclusivists. We must not give in to the the lies of the people out there saying we're arrogant to think we have the only way. The fact of the matter is we are all sinners. And our only hope before a righteous judge is to have our sins taken care of. God doesn't grade on a curve. He doesn't give any exceptions. Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice that God has accepted that we can be forgiven. So don't ever apologize for being exclusivist. Proclaim with boldness, as Peter did, there's one way and one way only. Repent of your sins, and your sins will be wiped away. That's your only hope. That's the only hope of anybody. But that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Our sins are forgiven. We understand the purpose of the book And we have the hope of the full and final restoration for all time because of the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Brother Rich, would you come and pray for us?